everybody. My name is Dr. Moon, and I am one of the professors at the University of West Alabama. I am in charge of the clinical experiences for school counseling students, but Dr. Wilkinson and I also co-teach residency, and this is where we work with you so you can kind of get your basic skills so that you can understand counseling and being a counselor and, um, and different things that you need to know so that you can be successful in this field. So today, what we're going to be talking about, feelings, everyone likes to talk about feelings, and we're going to be talking about explaining them, the experience of having feelings, defining them, how we use reflecting feelings as a tool in counseling, and just to kind of help you gain some confidence in, um, in the feeling model. So feelings are the root of all counseling. It's what we do. If we didn't have feelings, then, <laughs> then counselors would be out of a job. So let me give you some examples of, of what we experience when we have feelings. First of all, they are an internal psychological reaction to an experience. For example, um, when I'm getting ready to do a presentation, I have some feelings like, oh, I'm nervous. Will I be able to remember everything that I want to say? And I feel that viscerally inside myself. So it's a psychological reaction. But then you can also kind of have some more types of uh, things going on. Like when I was younger, uh, I did 4-H speaking. And when I would get up to do this in the speech contest, I would like start to, my heart would start to pound. And for the very first part at the very beginning, I would feel like I couldn't breathe really well. And I'm so glad that I actually went through that because now when I get in front of people and I'm gonna talk about things, I don't have that feeling anymore. But I had that very real, kind of nervousness feeling like, oh, am I actually going to be able to do this? And uh, even though feelings are internal, we also have outward symptoms of those feelings. So probably if you could have seen me for those few minutes at the very beginning of the speech when I was nervous, probably I was, um, you could probably look at me and tell that I wasn't quite comfortable just yet. So that's a little bit about feelings. Now, what are some outward symptoms of the feelings that we see? One of those is depression. If someone is feeling very sad, when we look at them, their affect is um, kind of dampened, their mood is kind of dampened, and we see that. Uh, when someone's pleased or excited about something, for example, when my husband brings me flowers and I'm not expecting them, I feel pleased. My outward appearance is I'm happy. He probably gets a hug and a kiss because I feel, I just feel good about it. And I also feel loved when something like that happens. But we also have other types of feelings, like when we're feeling fearful or when we're feeling embarrassed or anxious, you can look at somebody and you can normally see that those are experiences that, that they're feeling and that they have those different aspects. So I made a few notes. So sometimes when I'm talking to you, I may have to look back here to make sure that I'm telling you um, the right thing. Also, like, um, here's another example of me being embarrassed that was, that would have showed you reaction. You know how when, you know, you're in a group of people, like in a classroom, and everyone's kind of talking, doing something, and there'll be these moments where there's just a lull, you know, of, of silence. I remember in sixth grade, this was in math class, this is how embarrassed I was, I can remember it even now, is I was sitting there, and I was like cupping my mouth for some reason, I don't even know why I was doing that, but that quiet sound happened in the classroom, and I hiccuped really loud. And because I had my mouth <laughs> like this, the hiccup like ricocheted off, you know, the, the cement block room, you know, that we were in and everyone turns and looks at me and I probably just went totally red and was just like, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed about this. So even in sixth grade, you have that reaction, that physical reaction, and you can remember that for, for almost, <laughs> for a very long time in your life. So you'll be glad to know that there are only four primary feelings. And these feelings are sad, mad, glad, and scared. And as an elementary school counselor, when we go in and we talk with kids about emotions, those are pretty much the four emotions that they will be able to, to give you, that, that, they can, that they can kind of explain those to you. Those are very basic, like very basic things that you start doing. And then other feelings, and you're like, oh, Dr. Moon, but there's so many more feelings. Yes, there are. And other feelings are different conditions or different intensities of those original four. So I'm losing it there. Okay. So as counselors, the things that we need to, to do is to 
be able to experience those emotions ourselves, to start being aware of our own feelings. And to do this, we've got to start to be aware of how we react to what's going on around us. And that sounds like a really big job. <laughs> that sounds like a whole lot of things to go on. So how do we do this? How do we become aware of feelings? And the first of that is to start to get that information through the five senses. I like to talk about active listening a lot. When we're active listening, and I tell this to kids, you know, our bodies are still, our feet are still, we are looking at the person or we're, we're watching and we're hearing, that's one way that we become aware. Then we have to decide what that information means. Okay, so here's an example of, of what, that, what that might be, active listening. Let's say we have a tween girl and she is uh, in the hall and the kids are, you know, they're, they're moving in the hall. There's some girls that are sitting there talking and she happens to look over at these girls. And at that moment, the girls look at her and then they look away and they start talking to each other again. So as a, as a tween girl, she's probably, she's gathering this information through her five senses. She's like, oh my God, they looked at me and then they looked away and then they started talking. Are they talking about me? Are they whispering about me? So maybe she starts to get a different feeling. Maybe she starts to feel um, scared or she's sad or she's angry. She's like, why are they talking about me? Or she could be like, oh, you know, everyone always talks about me. It makes me so sad. But they could be irritated. I hate it when I go by these girls and it always looks like they're talking to me. And you can see how just from the senses that you can have all of these different types of, of feelings that come from that. And then you know, like I said, deciding what that information means can be a problem in itself because you don't know. The girl doesn't know exactly what's going on. She's just trying to process this with what's coming in. Then she can decide how she's going to express the feeling and express it. So does she um, confront the girls or does she ignore them? What does she do? So that's how we start to become aware of, of our feelings. And it looks like I have a duplicate slide. So I like to be arty on the slides for you. So I guess I couldn't figure out exactly what, uh, what slide I'd like to get to. Get to. Okay, so reflecting of feelings. The purpose of reflective feelings is to kind of help the client understand what's going on beneath the surface. And this gives us insight into the client's issue and progressing in the therapeutic process. So as counselors, I like to say, our job is to be the Nancy Drew of feelings. We're the ones who can look deep inside what's going on and help people understand what, what feeling they're actually feeling. What am I experiencing at this time? And by doing this, by, by being able to help people reflecting their feelings to this, this gives people the foundation that they need to start to change. So let's check this out. How does this go? Okay. The main thing that we do, as I'm saying, we're being the Nancy Drews of counseling, is that we are teaching people like how to check in with them. So by checking in, by reflecting feelings, we are making sure that the counselor is understanding the client, that we're helping to facilitate dialogue and helping them focus on the important issues. It also kind of keeps us, by, by reflecting feelings, it keeps us from asking too many questions all the time or trying to solve the problem. It just lets us sit with them, kind of give them some indicators of what we're seeing, and that helps pave the way for our clients to start to, to take action. All right, so one of the things that I would like for you to do, since you're gonna be Nancy Drew counseling, is to go out and find out all of the different types of feeling words that there are. So I would recommend to you to go on Google and just Google feelings, okay? And you will be able to find tons and tons of PDFs that you can print off that take the main, the, the four feelings that I was talking about and it turns them into a plethora of different feelings. So, you know, you're not just sad, mad, glad, or scared. You're frustrated, you're anxious, you're nervous. All of these types of things. So that's what that's what I want your job to do. Uh, sometimes this week or after hearing this recording is going out, pulling those off of the internet and learning about them. So that when you are reflecting back feelings to someone, that you have the, the verbal knowledge uh, to be able to pick out feelings that are going to be helpful. Okay, by reflecting feelings, we let the client know that we understand the content of what they're saying 
and we also are understanding the emotion of what they're saying. Let me go down here where my notes are so I'm telling you. Okay, so reflections should be based on the core message of the client's story. Okay, we want to focus on the main things that they're saying. And if you reflect on the insignificant information, the client might think that you're not really listening to them. So let's give an example. Let's say that we have a client and she is wanting to confront her boss about something. And she's kind of nervous about this. What you would want to do is you're listening to her talking about it and you would say, oh, you're feeling nervous about confronting your boss. But what if you didn't focus on what she's telling you? What if you said, well, what do your coworkers think about what you're saying? Well, is that really important? I mean, does it matter what her coworkers are thinking? No, it doesn't. You're just focusing on the story, just of what your client is telling you. So you're gonna do reflecting feelings back to them. And if you've not learned this, uh, this little counseling equation before, I want you to learn it now. It starts off with a sentence stem and it says, you feel, <laughs> I'm sure you guys have heard this one before. You feel blank. You feel sad, you feel anxious, add in the content, you feel anxious when you're thinking about confronting your boss. And then you're gonna reflect this in the present tense so we're staying in the here and now. So let me go down a little bit more. Okay, here's what it looks like. Basic is you feel blank. That's as far as it goes, very basic. But as a counselor, we want you to become more advanced about this. So it might say, um, you feel anxious, because you feel that your boss is not listening to you. And, um, and what that means for you is you feel like work is not a great place for you. You don't feel like you're feeling heard. You don't feel like your boss is listening to the things and that's making you irritated and it's making you not want to go to work in the morning, okay? So that's kind of an example of one. Here is another one. Okay, we have our girl Addison. Um, she is uh, frustrated because she didn't do a good job on an assignment in class. And she's a student, she's very motivated, wants to do really well. So the teacher says, if you do this assignment and you fix it over the weekend, then I will regrade it and we'll bring up your grading class. But Addison is very frustrated. So if you were in a counseling session with her and she's explaining this to you, she's like, oh, I had these plans to go out with my friends this weekend. We were gonna go to the movies and my terrible teacher, she wants me to redo it and it has to be done by Monday because I wanna have a good grade. My reflection to her would be, Addison, it sounds like you feel frustrated that your teacher asked you to complete the assignment over the weekend. You had plans to go up with your friends and now because you have to do the homework, um, you're gonna to have to cancel your movie night with friends. And that must be super frustrating for you. You see how you're taking, the, you're taking that reflection, you're taking that feeling that you're seeing you're reflecting it back to them. And you're trying to do this like over here, like I was saying, in an advanced way. You wanna be able as a counselor to do this advanced kind of feeling work. All right, so what can you reflect? Let me look on my notes to be sure that I am on point for you. Okay, here we go. What are you guys gonna be able to reflect? First thing is stated or implied feeling. You're talking with a mom, she's saying my son is terrible. He never picks up his room. It's so irritating to me. Your reflection would be you feel frustrated with your son. You also can reflect things that are nonverbal. Becoming counseling Nancy Drew, or for those of you, <laughs> for those of you guys that are out there, the counseling current and Hardy Boys, you're also going to start to see nonverbal signs. Nonverbal signs are, for instance, like I can tell by your clenched fist that you feel agitated when you think of your mother. Oh, I'm so agitated. So you can see that. One thing that my mom always did when I irritated her when I was a child, she would do this thing like with her jaw. <laughs> I can't really explain it. I call it the jaw thing. But when I was a child and I saw that kind of twitch, you know, on the side of her face, I knew that she was really, really upset with me. So that's a nonverbal cue. Uh, other things is holding your body really, really tightly. Um, or if you see a child that just, oh, it just looks so out of control, so frustrating. Different things like this, nonverbal things. And as, as, a, as a budding counselor, what I want you to do is just watch people everywhere. If you're at Walmart, watch people's body language. That's kind of what your nonverbal and body language are kind of the same thing. Um, 
maybe you're looking at someone and they're looking at birthday cards. Watch their nonverbal. Are they happy? Are they relaxed looking for this? Um, look around and see a mom with some children. What is her nonverbal? What are the kids nonverbal? The kids are crazy. The kids are well-behaved. Mom's frustrated. Mom's irritated with them because of uh, how they're acting in the store, or she's pleased because her kids are doing the right thing. Just start watching people. Uh, it's also in some of my classes, like in um, my adult child class, one of the things I have people do is just go observe a child doing something. So they may go to a park, they may go to McDonald's and watch kids in the play place. I just want them to watch them and kind of see what they're doing and see their different types of body language. So you can start doing that. Uh, you can start doing that right away. Now, you also can reflect what you feel has been omitted. So my example here is you wonder if it's worth fighting for. Let's say that you are doing a session with a, a mom. And I don't want to pick on mom. <laughs> I don't want to pick on mom. But sometimes it's easier for me to kind of come up with, uh, with examples like this because I've been a school counselor. I've worked with a lot of moms. Uh, so is your marriage worth fighting for? Sometimes they feel like their husband is kind of checked out, okay? So I might say to someone who's, um, who's being sad about that, I might say, you wonder if your marriage is worth fighting for. And that's a, that's a powerful statement, reflecting things back to them that they haven't said. And a lot of times there's so much meaning in what people do and what they don't say. Uh, here's specific content. It sounds as if you really despise being with your family. Now, Dr. Worthington made up uh, some of these slides. So if you see something and it seems like it's really down on families, what is being omitted in what Dr. Worthington is writing in his slide? But you see where I'm going with this. All right, so let's see what else we have. Reflecting content is basically paraphrasing. So it's taking the bulk of what the client has expressed and you're making it very, very small. You'll find that when you're in sessions with clients, either school counseling or in um, clinical mental health counseling, people will talk and talk and talk. We want them to talk. But as a therapist, we kind of are reining them in. We don't want them to just kind of go out there and just talk and talk and talk, and we never say anything, and we never help them take all of that feeling and focus it in. And I'm going to talk about funneling in a little bit, and that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about right now. But as your client talks, you want to help pull them in so that they can focus on the things that are really important. So um, once again, let's say we have a, a lady and she's talking about things at home. Uh, my husband never takes out the trash. My husband never plays with the kids. My husband never. So the example you might say to them is, it sounds like you're not satisfied in your marriage. It sounds like you're very unhappy with your husband. So you're taking all of that talk that they're giving you and you're bringing it down into an easier way to focus on this. Now, a lot of times, here we go. <laughs> a lot of times you will see uh, a therapist on television when they're like, in a, say that you're watching just some type of show on TV. And for some reason, the family is going into counseling and the counselor will sit back and they'll go, how does that make you feel? feel <laughs> and then they'll just kind of put their hand their you know their chin in their hand and they'll just kind of how does that make you feel you got to be careful with this question because it implies that it's something external that controls the feeling of the client I mean it, it kind of disempowers the client because something is out there that is making that client feel bad not because I have these internalized feelings I'm feeling bad but because something out there is doing it. So you want to be really, really careful and not kind of, uh, and not do it like that. I want you to reframe it as, um, how do you feel about that? Or how do you feel when blank happens? Okay, so let me give you another example. Let's say we have a middle school boy and there are some kids in class that like to pick at him. Okay, here's, this is a good example. I remember from being a, a school counselor. There was this kid, Let's call him Mark, just, just to make up the name for him. But he was um, kind of a little chubby kid. And whenever he got angry, everything would turn bright red. Like from the bottom of his neck, it would just come all the way up. And he had red hair. So this bright blush would come up, this bright red hair. 
And the kids would pick on him just because they wanted to see this reaction. They wanted to see him get really, really flustered and stuff like that. So if I was working with him in counseling, I would say, how does it feel when the kids try to tease you to make you get upset? How do you feel about that? What, what's it like? And I use that a lot with people. What's it like for you when, when that happens? When people tease you just to get a reaction out of you? How, does, how do you feel? And so some of his feelings might be like, I feel frustrated with them. I feel angry at them. They're messing with me constantly. You want to really work with the person so that you're finding out the feeling, how they're feeling about things. So we have a thing called the feelings expressions model. The feelings expression model, our goal using this model is to teach our clients how to describe their feelings. Okay. We want them, let me get back to my notes because I'll get away from it. <laughs> and then I'll go off on a tangent and I won't keep, keep on the slides. Okay, so we want them to describe their feelings using a personal statement, I, I feel, me, my, I feel. The next thing is the feeling name. I feel upset, I feel sad, I feel frustrated, I feel happy, all of these emotions. And that's why I want you to go on Google and find yourself a feeling thing. And, and maybe you could work on learning five new feeling words a day. And they're different. There's positive feeling words, but there are also negative feeling words. And I'm, and I'm saying negative, I'm not saying a, a negative connotation, but that those are not. So for example, like happy would be positive, sad would be a negative, but it's not a bad thing to have negative emotions. It's just, you know, different ends on the spectrum. So here's the example. I feel hurt and resentful when you choose to stay late at work rather than come home to spend time with me. That's using the feeling model. So let's do some ching, some activities. And since I'm not there with you, <laughs> we can't do the activities live, but we can kind of do them together. So the activity says, using the feeling expression model, how could the following examples be said to reflect the true feelings of the individual that's saying? All right, so this is gonna be fun. Let's, let's look at these and see. Okay, <laughs> and this looks just like the one that we just showed. Your significant other was supposed to be home for dinner at 8 p.m. and she was late. How would we use the model to do this? So first thing that we're gonna do is the personal statement, I. So your client would say I. Um, I feel hurt when you say you're gonna be home for dinner at 8 p.m. and then you're late. I feel sad, I feel unloved when you say you're going to be home at dinner and you are late. That's one way that you could use the feelings model with them. All right, here's another example. It says, you overheard your coworker on the phone talking about private matters that should not have been shared outside the office. Okay, here's an, here's an example. At my school, when I was a, an elementary school counselor, we had a music teacher who came in and worked with the kids. And each parent had to buy their child a recorder. You know, the little doo -doo -doo, <laughs> the three fine mice kind of recorder. And there was a teacher who had two kids in her class that could not purchase the recorders. So secretly, she purchased those recorders for her. Well, apparently a parent found out about that. And a parent called and was complaining to the principal that if the teacher was gonna buy recorders for two kids, that the teacher should have to buy a recorder for her kid too, and it wasn't fair that she had to pay for it blah, blah, blah. Well, the teacher happened to be walking by the principal's office when the principal was talking to this person on the phone. And she heard the principal say, well, the teacher's not right. She never should have done that, um, blah, 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 with the parent. And it really, really hurt the teacher's feelings because she felt that the principal should have said, okay, to the parent, I hear what you're saying. I'll look into the issue for you. Thanks for letting me know and then talked privately with, with the teacher about it. She shouldn't have said on the phone, the teacher shouldn't have done that, the teacher was wrong. She should never have said that to the parent. So if I was working with this teacher and talking to her, which I actually did, um, I would have said to her, you feel angry because you felt like the principal should have backed you up and she didn't, okay? You feel angry. This lady, she actually, this teacher actually felt furious because she felt like, the, the principal should have backed her up and she did it. And that was very hurtful and that was very frustrating for her. All right, so here's another one. Your friend didn't follow through with baking the cake. She had promised for a birthday party that you were hosting. 
this would be pretty bad if I was having a party and my friend was like, yeah, I got the cake, it's fine, I'll bring it, no problem. And then, oh, hey, oh, I didn't, I didn't do that. So if you're working with a client, you might say you felt, um, you felt angry with your friend, uh, you felt sad, you felt hurt that your friend didn't make the cake. So you see how we're using this model, the feeling, uh, the, the personal statement, the reflection of the feeling, and then what happened and how they, how they dealt with that. All right, so accurately communicating feeling. Let's take a look and see how we're going to go on. Accurately communicating. All right, so hang on one second. I think I have a note on this that I want you to do it. Yeah. Okay, so here we are. Uh, let's say that we're at Target and this, uh, this lady, once again, a lady with her child, uh, her son is crying, okay? And he's being one of those children that when they're crying, they're doing it on purpose, kind of to irritate the mom because they didn't get what they, what they want. So you have this kid and he's whiny and the mom is just like, stop, stop, stop doing that, stop crying. And then she finally loses it. And she's like, oh, shut up. You ruined everything for me. That's a lot. That's a whole lot in that right there. So how do you think she was feeling and how could she have conveyed this same thing differently? So let's say we're in therapy and she's talking about how she's like, I just lost it. I lost it because he just keeps doing this. I tell him no, he continues to do it. I just, I, I, I just can't, I can't stand it. It comes to a point where I just cannot stand it when he's whining like that in the store. How do you think she's feeling? How, if, if I'm in therapy and I'm reflecting that back to her, I would say, so what was, what was that like? Are you furious? Are you, are you anxious because you don't know what to do? Are you sad because you feel like your kid isn't acting like you, you would expect a child to act? Are you feeling like you are um, not doing it, not doing well as a parent, that you're failing as a parent? You see, there's so many things that she could be feeling. And you, the therapist, you're the Nancy Drew of this. And when you're working with someone, you need to be able to figure out how they're feeling and being able to help them put a label on it, okay? That's a big part of it, is having people put a label on their feelings. And once you have a label on it, then you can move on and you can start doing that emotional work to figure out what you need to do to feel to feel better as a person, to feel more successful as a person. And that, that's really your job. Now, how could she have convey, conveyed this core sentiment differently? Probably yelling at your child to shut up in the store is not the best, <laughs> is not the best way to, to deal with that. And never, never let someone feel like the way they acted was, makes them a bad person, as if they're a terrible mom for doing something like this. If I'm with her and I'm talking and she's like, I feel like I lost it. I felt out of control as a mom. And that makes me a bad mom. I said, no, you know, as parents, we often feel out of control. So let's think about how can we do this differently next time? How can we address this problem in a way that you'll have the skills to deal with your child if this happens again while you're in the store? So maybe instead of yelling at your kid, maybe we're going to leave the cart. We're going to take our child out to the car. We're going to sit with them, talk about them, about their behavior, or if they're having a crying fit or whatever, sit with them through that, talk with them. Maybe now you can go back in the store and shop. Maybe when you start to feel that way, you'll take your child out, you'll leave your cart, you'll take them out to the car, and you'll go home and you'll shop at another time. So see, there's lots of different things that you can do with them in therapy to help them think about how they can deal with things in a more positive way. I understand that sometimes, you know, taking your kid and not shopping at that point is not an option for a lot of moms that have to be working on things. So work on this. How can we have skills? How can we work with our kid at home to let them know what to expect when we go to the store or how we expect them to act when we get there? Working on stuff like that with mom. All right. So here's some statement. That was really dumb. You are so rude and arrogant. You don't care about me. Oh, you are so mean. All right, those are some statements. How can we make these statements in a way that is, um, that's a little more positive. That's, a, that's an easier way to do that. So for instance, our, our first one was, that was really dumb. 
So instead of saying to someone, that was really dumb, you could say to them, uh, that might not have been the best decision. You see how I'm doing that there? Instead of, that was really dumb. You said a really dumb thing. Uh, maybe that wasn't the best decision, okay? It's not like you're putting it on them, that they're terrible for, for saying something like that. We're reframing it in a different way. Here's the next one. You were so rude and arrogant. Maybe someone's saying that to you. Maybe you're speaking with your spouse or maybe you're speaking with your, your mom or your dad and you, you're saying something like that. Instead of rude and arrogant, you could say, I feel annoyed when you interrupt me, okay? And you can still have that. You can still let people know through your body language, through your facial expressions that you're feeling this way. But there's always a different way that you can refrain, refrain it in a way that's gonna be helpful, okay? So see what I'm saying? Like, um, if you say you're rude and arrogant, that makes the other people, the other person start to bristle up. I'm not rude and arrogant. I don't feel that way. But if you say to them in a different way, I feel annoyed when you interrupt me, you're getting the same point across, but you're doing it kind of in a more positive frame, all right? So the next one was, um, you don't care about me. Here we go. I feel like you're too busy to spend time with me. Or you can say, I feel sad because it seems like you don't want to spend time with me. And that's going to be much more productive with the, in a session with someone. Here was the next one. You're so mean. You could say, it hurts my feelings when you say things like that. Okay? And it's always good to work on this kind of stuff in your own life as a counselor. Okay? As you go through 509, as you go through pre-practicum with us, we're going to be teaching you a lot of different things. Some of those are basic counseling skills. I think in an earlier uh, lecture, Dr. Warbington probably went through basic counseling skills with you. My challenge to you is to start using those basic counseling skills all the time in your life. I want you to use it with your family. I want you to use it with your friends. I want you to use it at your job. All the time, work on basic counseling skills. Work on reframing things in a positive way. So if you're angry with someone, uh, you say, I feel frustrated when, when you do that. I feel angry with you when, when you do that. Um, also using basic counseling skills, if someone's saying something to you, like say that your sister is angry with you or she's frustrated with you and she said that, and she said something about that to you, like, oh, I'm so frustrated. You never listen to me when we talk about stuff like this. You could say to her, so what I'm hearing you say is you feel frustrated with me when I don't take mom to the doctor or when I'm unable to babysit your kids. You see how we're taking this, we're moving it from this um, giant angry feeling, we're learning how to bring it down and how to reflect it back in a more positive way. All right, so here we go, Nancy Drews and Hardy Boys. How do I know what my client is feeling? Okay, how do, how do we know, how do we know? Okay, a lot of times, well, I'll just, <laughs> let me go back to this. A lot of times we know how they're feeling because they've even they've told us like they told us or we're seeing those nonverbal body cues. And that's another thing I want you to start looking at is body language. How are people holding their bodies? This is um, this is interesting. If you I don't, I don't know how you guys would think about it, but as you know, um, Harry and Megan at the beginning of I think in March of 2021, depending on when you're listening to this recording. But um, Harry and Megan went on a show with Oprah. And they talked about their experiences as being part of the royal family, um, talked about some mental health issues that they felt had been overlooked and not listened to. So there's so much body language in that and how they're talking about how they're feeling and, um, and how their body, how they're holding their body, um, how hairy, how his expression looks. Now, I'm not saying anything. I don't understand what happened. I can listen to them and understand their experience but I don't know for sure um, is what they say true or is false. And it's not important. What, how, if you believe it or not, it's not important. But what I think is great is to watch them talk about their feelings and their experiences. So it'd be great for you to go, if you could, and watch that and look at, look at you know, how do you think they're feeling? How does Oprah reflect those feelings back to them? And I think that's very interesting. And another thing that you can do about that particular interview is on YouTube, there are a lot of body language experts who have gone and have watched this film and have talked about what the different feelings, like how she sat, how Harry did his shoulders, um, how she reached for him when she, you know, when she needed assurance or something like that. 
go and watch these body language experts talk about this. And it's absolutely fascinating. And this is a good thing for you as a counselor to learn because now you can know, oh, I'm seeing this. That might mean I can use this in the future to kind of understand people better. It's always interesting to people watch. I even like to do it. Like if I'm in the airport uh, waiting for a plane to go somewhere, I like to watch people as they go by. Are they relaxed? Are they on the phone? If they are on the phone, is it kind of a crazy conversation? Or are they, are they, you know, frustrated? Oh, I'm hurrying to get there. Or you see people, their plane is delayed. What kind of reaction do they have to that? It's lots of fun to people watch. So I recommend that you, that you do that. Now, sometimes uh, when you're working with a client, they may not know or they may not understand their feelings, okay? So they may mislabel the experience. And this is common. A lot of times you see this in children who do not have a large feeling vocabulary. And they don't know how to express to you what's going on inside them. Uh, also, when your clients are talking about feelings, the more deep and the more painful the feeling, the harder it is for them to express that because they feel as if they express these things, they may become vulnerable. And I see this a lot with men, especially men who are in positions of authority. They are very reluctant to talk about their feelings or to investigate their feelings because they may not seem men. They may not seem in control or in charge of what's going on. And that can be very, very hard for them. So you, you might want to kind of be on the lookout for different types of feelings. But we can perceive what the client is feeling by checking stuff. One, nonverbals. Just talked about that. Two is their content. What are they saying? What am I hearing you say? And I can reflect that back to them. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then the last one is our perception. As you work through basic counseling skills, as you go through the program, through practicum and internship, you will start to be able to see what someone's saying, watching their body language, and you can perceive what the underlying emotion is underneath that, the underlying feeling that's underneath that. All right, so let's see what we have here. I'm going to skip that one. See, sometimes I make notes and then I'm like, ah, I don't really like that slide. It's not so great. Okay. All right, understanding feelings, and I'll just kind of kind of go over what it says right here. Um, the feeling interpretation process is something we must learn to do as counselors and teach our clients how to do. And that goes back to what I was saying about the nonverbal and cues and things that you can pick up like that. But our goal is to become aware of the intentions and underlying motivations behind expressed feelings. Hmm, that's interesting. What are the motivations behind our expressed feelings? So these are the things that are underlying people's motivation. This, this is an example of kind of what makes us feel and what makes us act on different things. We want, our motivation comes from different things. Are we rejecting something? Are we avoiding something? Do we love something? Uh, are we trying to understand or cooperate? So Dr. Moon is going to... <laughs> I will, I will share some things with you. I am going to self-disclose. And self-disclosure, just I'll give you a thing. Self-disclosure is when we talk about ourselves or our own experiences of things that we have. As counselors, I don't want you to use self-disclosure very often, okay? The client doesn't need to know about your life and your things that are going on like that. Perhaps you're talking to someone who has lost a pet and they are grieving. And you might say, um, I understand what it's like to lose a pet, okay? That's, that's okay, you can self-disclose like that. But you don't need to say, oh, you know, um, when my pet passed away, it was awful, you know, I had to go and do this and that, and I felt this way, and then my husband, he was like, oh, you're, you see what I'm saying? It's just going on and on and on. You are not important. You are the, the, you are the therapist, you are the one that's listening, you are the one that's working on reflecting your feelings. So. Anyway, I'm gonna disclose to you, but I'm saying this is okay because I'm your professor <laughs> and I want you to understand underlying motivation. Okay, so I row on a row crew, you know, the people in the boats, you know, where they're like strokes, row. Okay, love it, love it, love it, love it. So this year um, we had a lady, an older lady come who wanted to learn to row, which is great, but she was not um, physically, or I don't, I don't need, I don't think mentally, she was much, much older. And she was not physically able to carry the boat. She was not able to carry her own oars. And she was not a fun person to row with because she was, um, I don't say she's disabled, but she's older and 
her body was not is not in the condition that it needs to be to be successful as as a rower. And I, I take this very seriously, and all my teammates take it very very seriously. And so it was it's very frustrating for us when she comes because we don't want to be ugly to her, but we're just not real happy that she's there. And people who are like, uh, I don't want to row with her because she's just not, it's not a good row. Okay, so what's our underlying motivation if we were going to say something to her? Um, are we trying to reject her? Are we trying to, um, to hurt her, to make her to go away? Will we say like something like, we don't like you here. We don't want you to be here with us. What kind of, what reflection of feeling is, is coming out? Are we wanting to hurt her? But do, or do we want to support her? You know, like, hey, it's great that you're older and you're trying to get into the sport. Yeah, you know, so it's probably a lot of this. So if I was with a therapist and I was talking to them about her, the therapist might say to me, you feel frustrated because it's difficult to row with her. And I would say, no. Um, I might say, no, I'm angry because I don't want to be put in a position where I have to say something to someone that might hurt their feelings. Or the therapist might say, um, I guess, I guess that, yeah, I guess angry is, is a lot of it. But you also, a therapist might say, do you feel, you feel sad because she can't do these things? And I also do feel sad for her because I think, you know, in the future, I'm going to be older, maybe harder for me to row. People may not want to row with me as much. So am I feeling sad for her? Yeah, maybe I'm feeling a little bit of sadness. So you see these underlying motivations that are underneath how we feel. And a good therapist is able to think about these motivations and be able to reflect back the feeling that they feel. And, and like with her, I feel lots of different things and that's okay. And as a therapist, it's really good to be able to recognize all those different things that a person feels. Because we're not just one thing or the other. We're not just mad, we're not just sad. We're this whole spectrum, this whole rainbow of emotions that are so beautiful because they make us human. And that is, you know, that's just, it's just great. <laughs> Humanity is great. And all of its, you know, sadness and all of its beauty and all of its sadness, it's just, it's a wonderful experience. And I don't know if you guys ever watched South Park. Uh, I'm a big fan. And there's an episode where Butters, who is one of the, one of the kids, he has a girlfriend and she's not, she doesn't feel the same way about him. And Butters is sad and he's crying and his friend is like, oh, this is so awful. And he's saying, no, he says, because I'm feeling this deep sadness, I know what it is to feel true love. So you see how those things kind of go together? Human experience, it's just, it's a neat thing. All right, so let's see, here we go. Um, all right, so here it says, it's important to remember that feelings don't always get expressed. And at times, feelings are not always recognized, accepted, and demonstrated constructively, which can lead to suppression and it can lead to denial. Now I have a note on this, but hang on, I'm look for it. All right. Now, there's a thing called Reddit, and Reddit is an app, it's a social media app where people can go on there and they have different groups. Uh, you can like say that um, there's one called only child and I'm an only child. So I like to go on there and read stuff. There's one called ask Reddit where people will ask questions and people will give their responses. And there's one on there called, um, called breaking mom. Okay. So in this one, in breaking mom, a lot of times ladies will talk about their husbands and their frustration at um, how they deal with child rearing with them. So they'll be like, oh, my husband, he plays video games all day. And when I ask him to cook dinner for the kids, he'll just say, I don't know how to do it. And he won't do anything. Or they'll talk about how um, their husband went and spent all the money that they had saved on some purchase that they didn't want them to. And it's always interesting to me to read these because I can see that the underlying feeling uh, of them is they want to be free. They want to be able to not have someone that is not working with them positively in a marriage. So when I read these, the ladies are talking about anger. They're talking about how much they hate, uh, how much they um, resent the things that their husband are doing. But what they're not recognizing is underneath it all, the main emotion is they want to feel free. They want to feel like um, that they are in control of their lives and that they're supported. 
So if you ever have a chance to go out, it's called Breaking Mom, but it's a good example of this, not recognizing the true feelings that are underneath it. And if you have time, go out and read a few of these little stories that are on there and see if you can figure out what emotions you would reflect back to them if you were actually doing therapy with them. It's kind of interesting. All right, so here we go. I think I have another example right here. Yes, I did, and that was what my note was for. Okay. And let me look at this note here. Okay. It says suppression and denial can alter your ability to accurately perceive an event or it may bias your judgment. So my note on here is, is going back to the, the ladies on breaking mom. Um, since they're so angry or so frustrated, they don't go and talk to their husbands about how they're feeling, okay? And if I was a marriage counselor and I was talking to one of these ladies, I would be like, let's bring him in and let me try to help mediate between you two so that you can explain how you're feeling about this. Um, but if they don't learn about their underlying feelings about this, if they don't do it, they're going to start to see their husband as someone who is um, evil or he's doing it deliberately to them. So see how that is starting to skew their judgment. It's starting to um, give them a bias towards that. So being able to work with people in therapy and try to help them understand where these underlying feelings are is a really, really great thing. Because then people can move on from, from that, they can move on from that issue, they can understand their feelings, and then they can start to work on their problems in a constructive way. So reflecting that is super, super important. All right, um, understanding the root of the feeling. Um, talking about a tree, if the root structure, if the root structure of a tree, if it's poisoned or it's diseased or it's dying, eventually you're going to see that on the outside of the root. Uh, for example, substance abuse in clients is not the underlying issue, but it, it's, it's an expression of that issue. There is a, um, a store in Arab, Alabama called Namely Claudia, which is not very far um, where I live. And my husband and I like to go to this coffee shop that's near it. So we were um, having coffee and we were laughing about the different types of things that they may have in, in, this, in this store for ladies, like purses, cutesy little signs for your kitchen, different things like that. So we were like, okay, let's go in the store and see what we thought is in there is here. So we go in there and there are these tea towels and they say, um, the wine housewives of Arab. And there's a big thing of wine next to it. Okay, so this goes along with kind of a, a thing that we see like on the real housewives of Orange County or whatever on the reality shows is that they drink a lot, all right? But but they drink and they kind of make it look cute. Like, oh, you know, we're wine moms. We do wine every day at 10. Or they try to make it look like it's a fun part of their personality. And this tea towel saying the wine housewives of Arab or whatever is trying to make it look cute. But is it really cute? So let, let's look up underneath that, right? Why are you drinking in the first place? and trying to turn the drinking into something fun. Like it's part of our lifestyle. You know, it's a drinking lifestyle. That's kind of like, perhaps there's a diseased part of the tree because if you go too far, drinking all the time, making it seem like it's something that's super common to drink a whole lot of the time, that's not a good thing. The underlying issue, what is that? Is it, why are you drinking so much? Why are you being a wine person very, very early in the day? So as a counselor, if I was talking to someone and they may be saying some things like this, I might want to kind of discuss this with them. Um, you feel sad and then you like to drink. When you drink, what is it like? What feelings do you feel when you're drinking? Okay, and this is not just for wine moms or whatever. This is for anybody. This is also substance abuse if you see this in community mental health. Why are they using a substance? Why is, what is going on behind this? And you're Nancy Drew, you're the Hardy Boys, you're looking for the understanding of the root of the feeling. Okay, there are three primary root conditions that bring people into counseling. Okay, these are the three reasons that you're gonna find people on your chair or on your sofa. Guilt and shame, bitterness and resentment, and rejection. All right, so here's an activity. And since you guys are not here with me, I will do the activity as if you are here. So, 
Okay, so what is the primary root feeling from these different examples? All right, so first one here is depressed. What is the root feeling from these examples? Go ahead, yell it out. I'll listen. What? What? Guilt and shame. Did I hear guilt and shame? Yes. Okay, depression is guilt and shame. So it could be for a lot of different reasons. Um, maybe the guilt and shame of not being enough. So here's an example. Miss America. Or I, <laughs> I used to like to watch Miss America. I also used to like to watch Miss Teen America, which was also fun. I, don't, I haven't seen them in ages. I don't know if they're, they're streaming services or whatever. But you would also see when when they were not you, you got your runner up right and they're calling them out and you see their face when they find out that they're a runner up they didn't win miss america they're a runner up and you see that look on their face like almost looks painful for a second and then they go back into the smile like oh yes i'm such a great gracious person how do you think they feel on the inside they're depressed because they feel guilt and they may feel shame and the guilt would be i should have been better and the shame is so many people believed in me and they spent time to help me learn my song or my talent or whatever, guilt and shame. So that comes a lot from depression. All right, frustration is often bitter and resentful. Like we were talking about earlier, um, the moms on the Breaking Mom Reddit, they're frustrated and they're frustrated because they're kind of bitter and resentful about what's going on in their lives right now. All right, let's take another one, um, embarrassed. That one would probably be embarrassed, could be guilt and shame. Um, I, th I think embarrassed could be guilt and shame. And then we have anxious. And I think anxious would be probably rejection. So let's say that we have a teenage boy and he likes a girl and he doesn't know if she's going to reject him or not. So he's feeling very anxious about this before he goes to ask her out. So that's, uh, those are your reasons right there. I, I have pleased and loved on there. Those are not reasons that, <laughs> those are not any of those. So I think those just mark those out. You don't see those in there. I guess it came from, from the earlier slide. All right, so now let's move on. As counselors, we've talked about a lot of the basics. Now we're gonna move into what is advanced empathy. And first off, I just wanna be clear on what empathy is because I didn't always know what it was until I started uh, to become a counselor. A lot of people will say that empathy is being able to walk a mile in someone's shoes. What that means is that you were able to take yourself and put yourself into the life of a person and try to understand what that's like for them. Um, for example, this past summer, this is 2021, for those of you who, um, 2020, 2021, think about that. We had the Black Lives Matter movement and a lot of people had to work to learn to put themselves in the shoes of black people and what that felt for them. What is it feeling for them? How do they feel in the United States? How do they feel like they're treated by the government? How do they feel like they're treated by um, the police? A very, very deep, deep, deep feeling of anger and frustration and hatred, all of those things that they're feeling. And it's important as counselors for us to be able to kind of think, if I'm in that situation, what is it really like? What is it like for someone like that? And that's what I want you to start to do is to move towards advanced empathy, to start moving towards understanding what it's like to be someone else and to understand their hardship. So advanced empathy goes behind the spoken message. It goes behind that. It's going deeper than just reflecting someone's feeling. It is starting to understand what is implied, what is partially expressed and what is implied. So let me get my little notes out so I'm on here. So um, becoming, using advanced empathy, this is kind of a learned counseling trait. You're probably not gonna have this right off. Something that you're gonna work for using those basic counseling responses, learning how to reflect feeling. This is all gonna to start to become part of who you are as a counselor. And this is the direction we want to go. This is the direction that we want to see you moving toward. So advanced empathy helps clients identify themes and it helps them make connections. And advanced empathy is challenging in that it places a demand on clients to look deeper into themselves and deeper into their issues. As a counselor, you're gonna start noticing themes that run through people's stories. 
I love listening. I always love listening to people's stories. No matter the story, I like to, I like to listen to them. The theme is the underlying, the underlying thing that, that is underneath it all. So let's say, let me, let me think of a different example. So I don't use like moms or dads or <laughs> something like that. Okay, let's say that I am working with a, a teenage girl who is living in a group home for girls uh, who have issues with behavior problems, okay? So I'm talking with her and I'm starting to see a theme of abandonment, okay? She's talking about her mother neglected her. She didn't know her father, move on. Living with grandmother or an aunt who didn't really want her there, but had to take her in to his family. Then she started acting bad. The aunt didn't want her anymore. So now she's moved on into a foster home, maybe a small one. She's, her behavior was a problem. So moved on to this new, new home. So you see this theme that's going through there, which is the theme of abandonment. So I want you to start being able to look at the stories that people are telling you and look at the underlying, um, the underlying thing about this. All right, so I got my notes. Got my notes for you. Here's an example of, of advanced sympathy, okay? Instead of saying you feel frustrated, you're going to this, you make it even bigger. You feel frustrated and it seems like you wonder if it's worth continuing to strive for. You see how I'm really starting to get in deeper with this. You feel frustrated and it seems like you wonder if it's worth continuing to strive for, okay? Do you see how I'm saying that as well? I'm not just saying you feel frustrated. Yeah, it seems like it's wonder if it's worth striving for. I am reaching deep into myself. I'm listening to, to myself as a person. How do I think that person feels? How can I bring that out so that we can bring it out there and we can focus on the real issue that it can? That's what it's doing. So I talked to you a little bit earlier. I said I was going to talk to you about funneling. Okay, funneling is when you take all of this broad and all of this general information that the client is sharing with you. And by using your skills, you can take all of this information and bring it down, funnel it down for your client so that they can better understand his or her underlying emotions. Okay, now you're gonna run into some potential areas of discomfort. What if you are wrong about the client's feelings? Okay, let's say they've been talking to you, you're listening to them and you say, um, you feel angry about that and they aren't angry, they are sad. And they say, um, no, I'm not angry, I'm sad. Okay, see? The client is gonna tell you if you are wrong about their feelings. But what I always like to do is check it out kind of to be sure. So I'll say, what I hear you saying is you are, you were irritated. And they might say, no, I'm not irritated, I'm curious. Or they'll say, yes, yes, exactly. And then they'll go on. So I think that's an important thing that we always need to do is to make sure that we are honing in on that feeling or checking, checking to make sure that the feeling we think that they're, that they're feeling is correct, okay? And this is not a big deal if you mess up and, um, and you know, mess up on um, picking out emotions because we always do that. But watch, and if you are always wrong, <laughs> if you're always wrong, then we need to focus on why are you not processing it correctly? Why are you not feeling this type of empathy? So as you progress in your studies with us, if you see that you're having a hard time identifying emotions, let us know and let us work with you on that because these are skills that you need to have as a counselor, as a community of mental health, as a school counselor, you need to be able to identify feelings and be able to reflect them back. So if you're having a hard time, just let us know. Now, the emotional intensity of the client. Not all clients express emotions in the same way and not all clients express emotions in the way that we expect them to. Let me make sure I don't have a note on that for you. Okay, emotional intensity. Didn't have a note right there, I have a note here. There are different types of emotional intensity, different types of ways that people feel emotion. Sometimes you've got people who are sensory motor emotional orientation and they truly feel the emotions. Like everything is physical about them. So if they're happy, everything is happy. Their mood's up, their body feels great. It's not you know sore or tense in any way, they're feeling it. Or they have depression and 
oh, it is just terrible. It just pulls everything down. Their body is sore. They have a headache. They're just miserable. Oh, it's just so difficult for them. So these are sensory motor emotional orientations. Okay. Other times you'll have clients that have concrete emotional orientation and they can name the feeling, but they don't really experience them. And this is kind of unusual. And we'll talk about that another time. I just wanted to let you know about, about these feelings. Now, sometimes you have clients that have abstract emotional orientation. And these people really think a lot about their emotions. They may not feel it physically like the other ones, but they spend a lot of their time processing feelings of how they're feeling about stuff that's going on to their, in their lives. Okay, so here's one, it's called checking out. This is a skill that we use. And we use this if we are confused about something that they're telling us or that we have a hunch and we're gonna use this to kind of confirm or correct the state. So um, let's say that I'm chatting with someone, a parent, let's say I'm chatting with a parent and they are talking about that their child is, um, is failing in school and um, they're embarrassed about that, okay? So, but they're not telling me they're embarrassed about it. They're just talking about their kid at school and it's just, um, it's terrible that he's not as great as the other kids or something. So I might say to them, you know, I think that you're embarrassed about having a child that doesn't do well in school. Like you personally are embarrassed about that. And they might say, exactly, I, I do feel embarrassed. I feel like the other people are watching me and they're like, oh, her kid doesn't do good in school and it makes me embarrassed. So I might say this as a way to, to bring it up. Or I may have a hunch about something like um, maybe a, a man is in therapy with me and he's talking about his wife and I just don't love her anymore. But I'm starting to feel like, mm, I wonder if he's seeing someone else. And all of this kind of negative thoughts about his wife, maybe he's feeling bad because he's seeing someone else. So I might say, um, I'm listening to you talk about this, but I'm kind of wondering, are you seeing someone else? Are you, are you, are your emotions really with your wife? Are they, are you sharing them with someone else? Okay. And I could be right. And if I'm going to say something <laughs> that serious, I probably have the hunch that I'm right. But I want to bring this out. I want to bring out this feeling so that I can check it out with them. And that's what we do when we are um, when we're playing out a hunch. Okay. Here's some other phrases that you will hear me say while I'm working with someone, if I want to, because I want to check in and I want to make sure that I'm on the right, right page with them. So one of those things is, you know, am I hearing you correctly? Or um, if I'm paraphrasing something, I might say, um, sounds like your job is uh, really hard for you right now. And one of your coworkers is just really stressing you out. Is that close to what you're feeling? And they'll say, exactly, that's how I feel. Or they'll say, no, that's not exactly what I'm feeling. And then they will go ahead and then they will share that with you. So I like to do that. I like to check in with them to make sure that I am uh, going along well. Now, these go with the basic counseling techniques that Dr. Worthington has already talked to you about, um, paraphrasing and summarizing. Paraphrasing, kind of like funneling, it's when they tell you a lot of stuff and you bring it down into, you bring it down into a short story and you use that to check in with them. Or summarizing, where we've talked about something for a while, now it's the end of our session. I will do a quick summary of all of the things that we've talked about. I'll check in with them, make sure that I'm right in that summary, and then we can move on from there. So that's the way that I do that. Okay, here's another one. I also like to do this if I'm talking with someone and I'm not sure. Um, I'll say, okay, I'm a little confused right now. Um, you said that your friend is very supportive of you, but you also say that you feel like she talks about you behind your back. A little confused. And then they can go ahead and they can clear that up for you. Um, this is also kind of known as a confrontation in your basic counseling skills. And I want you to understand that when we say that we confront people in counseling, we're not like, oh, I'm confronting you right now. Uh, confrontation is when we, like I'm saying, I'm a little confused right now. Or maybe someone is laughing when I think that what they're telling me is something that a person should be crying about. So I'll say, you're saying this to me and I see that you're laughing about it. But what I'm hearing you say uh, doesn't really go with that emotion very well. What, what do you think about that? So I'll do something like that to check in with them. 
be sure that when you're working with clients, you talk to them in a way that they know how genuine you are. If you're coming into counseling, guys, you have to want to help people, okay? That's what we do. We help people. You have to learn how to be genuine, how to be present, how to listen to someone. And it's hard. I mean, it is not easy listening to people's stories, looking at the themes of their stories. People, life is hard. And you'll be hearing a lot of stories that will be hard. And you have to feel comfortable sitting with a person, listening to them telling you things about their life that are difficult and caring enough about them, being empathetic enough with them to be genuine, okay? So work on this. While you're practicing your basic counseling skills, and I'll tell you this, you'll be in all my classes and I'll tell you this, practice those skills on everybody, your friends, your family at work, practice those. Work on becoming a genuine person and become the kind of person that other people know that you're genuine, that you're real, that you're listening to them. All right, so yay, it's example time. Let's take a look at some examples of how the counselor can respond. All right, so Peter says to the counselor, what seems to be really bothering me is a problem of sex. I don't know whether I'm a man or not, and I'm in college. I don't go out with women. I don't even think I want to. I may, I may be gay, but I don't know, all right? That's a big thing. So how would the counselor respond? This is what I would say to them. All right. So Peter, what I hear you saying is that you're confused about your sexual identity because you're not really interested in dating women. And it makes you feel bad about yourself and you're wondering, is something wrong with me? Am I hearing you correctly? So you see how I did that? I'm checking in with them. Am I hearing you? And I paraphrased everything he said. I paraphrased it. I funneled it down. So we can focus on that. So we can focus on what I'm hearing. Okay. So giving a response to somebody, you are paraphrasing what they say, reflecting the feeling, and you're checking that out. You're checking in with them to make sure that what you're saying is correct. Now, I want you guys to be very clear, very clear on this, that your personal opinion about the client's issues are not appropriate ever, ever, guys. Okay. If you have a problem with homosexuality, do not bring that into the counseling session. Do not ever try to um, self-disclose or bring in your thoughts or opinions. That's not important, okay? And if, if you have personal opinions about some things that really, really bother you because of your religious beliefs or something like that, then you need to either A, refer a client that has those types of, uh, those types of um, issues that they're working through. You need to refer them to somebody else. Or you need to learn how to separate your personal thoughts and be a counselor that's empathetic and is not judgmental, okay? Very important that you guys understand that right out the bat. Okay, um, you also need to choose the right emotion and level of intensity for these client states. Let's check some more out. Okay, so here's this guy and he's like, I'm so sick of that, sick and tired of that jerk thinking he can take credit for all my ideas at work. All right. So what of these four little emotions that I put up there, what do you think the emotion that he's trying to share with you is? And I'll wait, and I'll listen to you. Okay, he could be lots of those. He could be miserable, he could be disturbed, he could be annoyed or seething. And all of these are emotion words that you can reflect back to him. You can say, so you're feeling miserable about this. Well, maybe he's not miserable. Maybe he's seething, he's so angry. He's like, no, I'm not miserable. I'm just angry, I'm just seething at him. Okay, so this way you're checking in with them on their emotions. So here's another guy. He says, I'm so tired. I feel like everyone in my life is a parasite. They're sucking the life out of me. I never have time for myself. So here's some emotions down here that you might think about. What emotion do you think he's feeling? So if I were working with this guy, I would probably say, Vex is a good one. I think I might say, so it seems like you're feeling really vexed about this, but maybe he says, no, that's not it. So then I would say, are you feeling depressed? Are you feeling depressed about this? And then he would say, exactly. So I checked in. So maybe my first one vexed is not quite great. All right, let's take another one. This lady says, I don't know what to do. Now that my husband's been laid off, we're getting behind on our bills. We don't have anywhere to live. And I know we're going to get kicked out of our home soon. 
Which of these do you think it is? Ill at ease, awkward, embarrassed, or worried? It could be a lot of those, right? She could be embarrassed because um, she's going to be homeless. And to her, that is just, you know, unacceptable. And what will her, what will her mom say? What will her sister say? Um, another one, I probably, I probably would go with worried right off the bat. I'd be like, you are really worried about this because this seems super serious. And she would probably say, yes, I'm very worried about it. See, there's different emotions that you can use. All right, next one. Ah, I hate graduate school. I don't know why I thought I could do this. It seems like everyone else has it together, you know. They do well on the exams. They turn in their papers on time. I'm just not as smart as they are, and I just can't get things done. I would choose, I might say inferior, you know. You feel inferior to the other students, and I'd be interested to hear what they're saying. Or, um, they could also feel ashamed. They feel like everyone's doing better than they are. They should be getting it easily and they're not. So I might say, are you feeling ashamed about that? And see, I'm checking in with them. I'm looking at them. I'm thinking, this is, is this the emotion? And then they can tell me no, or they can tell me yes. And then we can kind of go on. All right, so let's see. Oh, we got another one. Okay. I don't know what to think about my son. He back talks me, he treats me like a dog and I gave birth to him. I try to talk to him and he ignores me. So here we have some down here. Um, I probably wouldn't say aggravated because to me, she seems a little more frustrated than aggravated. I would probably go with afraid. You feel afraid about, about how your son is acting towards you. How I would check in with him. All right, so let's see. Okay, here we've got our little summary, summarizing what we were talking about. Okay, so there's a whole lot of things that you need to consider when you're reflecting feelings. And being appropriate in your reflections is gonna be something that you're gonna work on in this class and you're gonna continue work on as you're here at school. So don't feel bad if right off you're not reflecting correctly you're not understanding exactly how I'm supposed to paraphrase or summarize or you know ask questions, stuff like that. It's okay. It's something that you're going to work on. Uh, the goal is to help clients reframe the statements of their own feelings so they're able to communicate. So you're helping them put a label on it, put a label on their feelings. Then you can move from the feeling into the work of counseling, which is moving past that, learning counseling skills, teaching people um, how to deal with problems, educating people. That's part of what you do. You reflect the feeling, then you work on educating. And um, helping clients to reflect their feeling lets them have ownership of who they are and what they're experiencing. And that is the heart of being a good counselor, is being someone who can sit and who can listen, who can hear what they're saying, reflect it back to them, teach them coping skills, and be supportive. So I hope that you enjoyed this lecture. Uh, I had a good time doing it with you. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email. My uh, email is pmoon at uwa.edu. And I've had a lot of fun doing this and I hope that you had a nice time learning.